flying MiG cap in North Vietnam. We shot down two MiG. On the 24th of July, I was flying number two in a flight of four when something came through the clouds I'd never seen before. It looked like a flying telephone pole with fins on it, a fiery tail. And before I could even press the mic button, it had detonated right under the formation. They were Russian SAMs, guided by radar, and they usually hit. Oh, Lord, I got tales that I can tell, oh, Lord, what it's like down in the hell, oh, Lord. I got tales that I can tell, I got tales that I can tell, oh, Lord. We weren't really ready for a lot of what happened in the air over Vietnam. We'd spent the 50s building our strategic air forces. We could deliver nuclear weapons, but since we hadn't focused on our tactical forces, we weren't prepared for limited conflict. The Kennedy administration started rebuilding our tactical forces, and Vietnam was the first test. We met intimidating opposition, AAA anti-aircraft artillery and Russian MiGs flown by the Vietnamese. But we managed to hold our own until they brought in the new Russian surface-to-air missiles. They found you and shot you down using radar, and you never knew they were there. It was a new world of warfare, called for new weapons, new will, and the wild weasel. I have seen fire and thunder in the sky. I have known men who weren't afraid to die. I have seen men take eagle's wings and fly. I got tales that I can tell, oh Lord. This is not the story of the Vietnam War or the politics that put us there. It's the story of industry and military joining together to meet a new and dangerous threat of long and desperate hours of engineering, of long and frantic minutes in the range of deadly weapons, of violent maneuvers and perilous attacks, a story of sadness and anger, of dedication and courage, of skill and cunning. It's the story of the creation in crisis of a special Air Force mission crucial then and now and in the future. Mostly, it's a story of people told by those who were there. We all got heavy damage, but number four was on fire and he had to eject. Uh, the backseater was killed. Uh, the aircraft commander spent seven and a half years in a PW camp. And on the way home, I was wondering how we're gonna live in an environment, uh, the skies of North Vietnam full of sand. Uh, but being fighter pilots, I knew we'd go back. Uh, it was just a matter of uh, how many pilots we had to lose before we learned how to counter it. The saying among some of the people in the Pentagon was that the uh, uh, North Vietnamese had uh, established air superiority uh, with ground air missiles. But the loss of personnel at that time was probably the highest we ever had in the history of the Air Force. I suppose it was a deficiency of tactical thinking uh, that this hadn't been considered before. But there was an ability to uh, react quickly. Harold Brown authorized immediately the use of $1 million emergency funds, the highest priority that can be applied to any program in emergencies. A specially appointed SAM task force immediately went to industry seeking ideas for combating the Russian SAMs. They came up with a novel concept. You want me to fly in the back of a little tiny fighter aircraft with a crazy fighter pilot who thinks he's invincible, home in on a SAM site in North Vietnam and shoot it before it shoots me? You've gotta be shitting me. I feel loneliness and fear and pain. I have seen brave and daring deeds insane I've seen this was the birth of the wild weasel a two-seat f-100 super saber designed to hunt down the SAM sites electronically and lead the attack on them it was equipped with a special new team an electronic warfare officer in the back seat operating radar warning equipment to find the SAMs and a pilot in the front this wild weasel was the first tactical fighter to use radar detection equipment to kill SAM sites and it was the first mission to make an electronic warfare officer part of a fighter air crew. We called them EWOs, and they played a critical role in the early development of this system. Yet the project was so classified that they knew nothing of their assignment until they arrived at the secret hangar. 
The next morning early, an unmarked car picked us up and took us to Long Beach Airport, which is just a regular general aviation type airport. And uh, there were some really ratty looking butler buildings off to the side, and they were well guarded, of course, but I mean, they were really run down and ratty. And we got in after our credentials were checked. And sure enough, inside there was an F-100 with its guts hanging out all over the place and uh, spaghetti wiring strung all over the place. But more important than that, I guess, there was air-conditioned hangars in there where North American Aviation had put about 30 of their very top aerospace engineers in it. Well, we met with those folks, and the next day we went to Palo Alto to meet with the, the officials of a small company called Applied Technology Incorporated at Palo Alto and they made the boxes. What we had developed was a series of black boxes that made up a system called radar homing and warning system. What it did basically was provide the air crew with indications of which direction threat radar signals were coming from. This box was really a breakthrough because prior to the invention of this box, if you wanted to determine radar direction, you had to use a very large antenna on a very large airplane. And certainly there's no way to get a large antenna on a fighter aircraft. So Grigsby's people uh, replaced that large antenna with four small antennas on a fighter. Technical work went fast, and so did business. No one had time for contract formalities. As we concluded our discussions, we decided we better get something down so that we'd know what it was we were talking about. And so Air walked over to the uh, blackboard and started writing quantities of items on the blackboard. And he says, now, Pierre, how much do you want? And he says, well, let me write it down, I'll take it back. He says, never mind that, Pierre, get up here and sign your name. So everyone went to the blackboard and signed their name, and then they took a Polaroid picture of it, and that became the contract. But the direction finding set wasn't enough, and ATI developed several other boxes. We had three boxes aboard the airplane, a set of boxes to tell when the radar was illuminating you and from what direction, a set of boxes to help you discriminate between multiple radars illuminating you, and a set of boxes to tell when a missile was being launched at you. These boxes were the forerunner of the weasel system. They were built up in a very short order. They were primitive by today's standards. Uh, in fact, we had to cut and paste, cut sheet metal, rob and steal, and sometimes buy from the local electronic shop. But we put them together in 90 days, and they worked. Testing at Eglin proved these systems worked in the airplane. So the pilot EWO teams were brought together. Well, we'd never seen the fighter pilots up close before, and uh, all we knew is that they were trained to be aggressive and obnoxious, and they certainly didn't disappoint us. The fighter pilots that were selected had about 2,000 hours total flying time. Flight leaders are highly qualified. They're extremely competent, and we're probably the world's best. He wrote the words, world's greatest fighter pilot, on his visor, but he wrote it backwards, so when he looked in the mirror, it, it read correctly. We weren't too happy about the team concept because fighter pilots are like gladiators. They like it one-on-one. -on -one. We was insistent on one thing for sure, and that was to be crewing up. We consider this very, very important to be crewed up. And uh, so we got together and drank martinis with the fighter pilots, and of course they were all crazy. And we were trying to determine how to, to, how to crew up. And uh, I guess after a few martinis, some magic process happened. The mating process, I still don't understand. We just were pulled towards each other, and uh, that's how we were married up. It was a chemistry thing, because we had to have complete trust in each other. I guess we needed those Evos in the back seat, because the fighter pilots weren't doing too good on their own. The SAMs were driving them down into the smaller arms fire, and uh, everyone was hoping that this weapon system would work when we deployed it. When we were ready to deploy, the Secretary of the Air Force, Harold Brown, came down, the Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force, the Tech Commander and several other generals were here to visit us, and the purpose was to give us a pep talk. We were lined up along here, and the aircraft was parked over here. I remember climbing up a ladder to look into the airplane and uh, uh, meeting uh, some of the crews. I said to them that uh, their mission was critical to uh, the success of uh, U.S. Air Force capabilities and uh, wish them good luck. But it was not a rah-rah type talk. It was just do the best you can and we're counting on you. Uh, someone remarked that uh, the chief of staff of the Air Force was not, not present. And uh, another astute individual remarked that he's in church pl praying for the success of the mission. 
Bob Trier was standing next to me, and he said, he's talking like some of us aren't coming back. And I said, yeah, I know. Four F-100Fs and five pilot EWO crews were deployed to Vietnam in complete secrecy. They arrived at Karat Air Base in Thailand on Thanksgiving Day, 1965, just 89 days after the program began. One of the first things I learned after landing at Karat is a good friend of mine had taken a SAM hit the day before. We wanted to put the hurt on those SAMs bad. I have seen fire and thunder in the sky. I have known men who weren't afraid to die. I have seen men take eagles' wings and fly. I got tales that I can tell, oh Lord. The weasels were to lead F-105 attackers in on their wings. The weasels would use their electronic equipment to hunt down the mobile SA-2 sites and then attack them with rockets. The F-105 thuds, carrying the heavy weapons, would follow them in to kill the site. This mission was called Hunter Killer. We had to figure out our own tactics based on what little we knew about the SA-2 system. We knew that its range was about 15 to 20 miles. We knew that it had a target tracking radar, and we would use that to home in on it and find it, because they were usually camouflaged. We knew that we could survive at low level, and by using terrain masking, that uh, we could pop up, get our readings, and then attack the site, hopefully without getting killed. The Weasel's second role was to protect the strike force during their regular missions. The Weasels would warn them of nearby SAMs and keep the sites busy while the strikers zeroed in on their target. The Weasels would orbit in the target area from 20 minutes up to 40 minutes, exposed to all of the AAA in the fire. This created a high fatality rate for the Wild Weasel mission. We were always the first in and the last out. The first two weeks were discouraging. The weasels were floundering and heads were shaking. The weasels lost an airplane and crew before they got a SAM site. Bob Trier and I uh, stayed up late one night just talking about life in general and talking about being a POW if we were shot down. And we both decided and talked about that we could not survive as a POW and that if we went down, we were either going to shoot our way out and walk out or take a bunch of them with us. And that was a couple of days before Bob was shot down. And uh, John Pitchard punched out and had hit the ground, and he heard a lot of gunfire about a quarter of a mile away where Bob was. And when John Pitchard surrendered, they shot him in the arm, and he was laying on the cell floor the next day, and a Vietnamese lieutenant came in and kicked him. And he said, your co-pilot created great sorrow yesterday. So I know that Bob took a bunch of them with him, even after he was on the ground, and he kind of set the stage for the EWOs and the standard that all the weasels followed, that even when you hit the ground, you don't stop. I have felt deep within my heart I have seen mother's sons blown apart I have seen Satan's wicked fiery darts I got tales that I can tell oh Lord well that was December 20th and of course people were pretty worried about the program at that time and I think the program almost got canceled. But then on December 22nd, we had our first successful mission. And boy, was that sweet. We picked a Sam up, and I was running against him and dropping down in the valleys and using the hills for masking. I'd pop up, roll the wings level, Jack would get a reading, and I'd dip back down in the valley. We kept doing this, and I kept keeping the Sam at 10 and 11 o'clock so he wouldn't think I was heading directly towards him. And the signal got so strong that I'm sure we were out of ridges. We were going to be out of ridges. So I said to L, uh, and he said, I've got it. And instead of going over the last bridge, he went to the right down a little valley. And we broke out in the Red River Delta. I popped up to the left. I had the strobes going off to the left of the scope. I rolled in birding, and I saw him. So L fired both rocket canisters and hit one of the launchers. And then he yelled to the thuds on uh, UHF radio and, and called out where the site was. Finally, one of them says, I got it, I got it, I got it. And I saw lead roll in, and as he was coming down to shoot, I saw him firing, and everything started lighting up. But you have to get to the radar, and we knew we hadn't gotten it because it was heavily camouflaged. I was still coming back around for a second pass when I finally picked up the van. It was highly camouflaged, and I was way out of range, but I just started strafing, and I just walked. 
the rounds up to it in the right side of the van started lighting up and he went off the air at that time. Here's the sack kid in an F-100 leading a V formation, a victory formation of F-105s over Karat in the middle of the Bob Hope show. That was a signal to people at the show that we'd had a success and by the time we got to the club the party was already in full bloom. And one reason it was such a good celebration that we knew we had the Sam. We knew now that, yeah, baby, every time you turn that Sam on, your hand may trigger, may tremble because there may be a weasel coming right down your throat. We had a wild party. And uh, Gary Willard, our commander, sent out a message to the Pentagon saying, sighted Sam, destroyed Sam, and uh, very original, as you know. And uh, there was a lot of celebrating in the Pentagon that day. The success was publicized but not who did it or that the site was found electronically. The weasel mission was still highly classified, but now the air crews in Southeast Asia saw that it was a concept that worked. But there was a price, a high price. It was one of the most dangerous missions in the Air Force at that time. The weasels lost five out of the seven F-100Fs deployed. When death seems that close, you can't help but wonder if you'll see the next day dawn. Can you say will the sun I never met a weasel that didn't like what he did. Also never met a weasel that wasn't scared to death while they were doing it. The pressure builds just before takeoff and you know, had a queasy stomach, but you learn to control the fear and just do your job. The only one that knows how truly afraid you are, you're laundress. And uh, that's true, you get, you get scared, but there's no big deal, you're busy. The pressure could get to you, I guess, if you didn't let it off. Heck, there were nights that a guy would come riding a motorcycle right through the bar yelling his head off just to forget the day he had. We were in a stress situation. We, uh, we worked hard. We worked hard towards a common objective. Uh, people were being shot at. Some were being killed. Working towards that common objective, we all became close. There was a togetherness that existed between, especially between the pilots and the EWs. There was a lot of harassment, a lot of jokes. But the, there was really a cohesiveness, a togetherness that never existed any place else I've ever seen in the Air Force. That cohesiveness, that two-man team concept, just kind of rippled out into everything else, all the way into industry. We felt part of the team. We were members. We belonged. We were friends. And I'd stand on that line frequently waiting for these people to come back, waiting for my friends to come back, and they didn't return. Seems to me I have been Weasels had a saying that we flew and fought so that our buddies could live over the skies of North Vietnam. We didn't really think about the political aspects and the world opinion of the war. The only thing we were concerned about was that they all came back home. We really lived together. Everybody depended upon each other, military, industry. Uh, you had a job to do, and you did it because if something didn't work, somebody died. Those systems were really worked. They were really checked. The maintenance crews worked on those things like you wouldn't believe. They stole parts where necessary. They made them work, and they checked them before every flight. We knew guys' lives were hanging on those systems, and we made damn sure they were good systems and they'd come back with those systems still working. Many of us went 100 missions with no equipment failure or only partial failure, and that kind of became a trademark of the Weasel Keepers. You have to remember, we were developing tactics and systems at the same time. Uh, no one had a pat tactic for killing Sams without getting killed. We were doing things by the seat of our pants. It was a very fluid situation. Uh, we had no documentation. We made changes in the airplane. We made changes in the equipment. We made changes in tactics. But the tactics were often frustrated due to the mismatch between the F-100 Weasels and the 105s they escorted. 
After a few months, the squadron sent a message to the Pentagon explaining that 105 strike aircraft was much faster. And uh, while we were 100s, had to use the afterburners, which ate up the fuel, reduced his range and time on target to support the strike aircraft. Of course, every time 105s got, got scared, they had you know, smoke off at 600 knots and a poor old F-100s couldn't keep up. So they'd be, be one solo weasel and four thuds gone, right? So they decided they needed a little something more compatible. The Pentagon moved fast. They outfitted the 105F, a two-seat thud, with weasel gear. It added the Shrike missile, a missile that would home in on the enemy radar. The weasels still couldn't shoot from outside the range of the SAMs, but at least they could get away from the AAA guarding the sites. By the late spring of 1966, about a dozen F-105F weasels had joined the squadrons in Thailand at Karat and Tak Lee. The 105s were a more capable weapon system, but no one knew quite how to use them. And at first, many were lost. I'm a thud pilot. I love my plane. It is my body, I am its brain, she's packed with transistors, black boxes, diodes, but stay alert, cause you might get hurt when she explodes. We really didn't have any experience to build on, we were still wondering, wonder what works, because uh, out of the first six thuds that went to talk weasels that went to talk Lee, six weeks after they got there, there was one left. It was partly due to our inexperience. Uh, learning against a, uh, a system that's as lethal as the Soviet SAM system is a pretty risky business. And the weather played a big factor, too. Uh, Ed Larson and I uh, went chasing a SAM site north of Hanoi, and we fired a strike at it, and it in turn fired at us. Uh, we were in and out of the clouds, we dodged two of the missiles, and then the third one came at us right out of Cloud Bank, it was about 100 yards ahead, and we had nothing to do but to sit there and wait for the explosion. The uh, missile blew the, the nose off the aircraft, and we went out on the coast about another minute and a half, and the controls were gone completely, so we uh, bailed out after saying very brave things to each other, much braver than I'm sure we felt, you know, like, hey, see you later, you know, and good luck, and uh, see you in the water, and that sort of thing, and... Uh, uh, just as soon as we got under our canopy, uh, well, maybe about a minute later, as the aircraft was spiraling down and exploded. So obviously there was a fire in there that we were unaware of, and maybe uh, we were more fortunate than, than many. You know, many didn't make it back at all. I just go on down to Banana Valley. Go on down and meet your fate. Just go on down to Banana Valley. A dud pilot from Taki Lee got hit and went down in a small village outside of Than Hua during the ejection. Evidently, he lost his pistol or sidearm. And after he hit the ground, he was talking to the members of his flight who were circling overhead and says, here come the natives, and they looked teed off. Well, the natives clubbed him and beat him to death and then hung his body up. We stayed up for a couple of days, and then they took it down and buried it, either threw it away. Taki Lee wanted to come back and uh, bum the village off the face of the earth. but. They couldn't get permission. When you go down, 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 you better learn to hate. We lost a lot of airplanes because we could not fly and fight the way we thought we should up there. There were a tremendous amount of restrictions on us on what we could do and not do in the skies of North Vietnam. We flew past airfields every day and saw the MiGs sitting down there or taxiing out for takeoff but we weren't allowed to hit them. I got madder in hell one day. I saw a, yeah, an intelligence photograph of a loading area near Haiphong with about 170 missile canisters sitting there and a real fantastic target, uh, but we weren't allowed to hit it. We had to wait and take those missiles on one at a time as they came at us in the air. Uh, we should never again ask men to die if we're not gonna give them a chance to win. We took a lot of losses, but the madder you get, the more you wanna win. And we were learning how to win, but it takes more than anger. Being a weasel was a whole lot like uh, a three-dimensional chess in which cheating's legal. What's that telltale wisp I see? That's a contrail pulled by a fish bed sea. The cards are stacked and it looks like time to deal. The lead's got bandits, 12 o'clock high. Let's spin it around and scramble for sky and arm your guns. This ain't no game, it's real. 
And the pieces weren't kings and pawns, but missiles and guns. And you couldn't study the board before making your move. The equipment worked well as far as it went, but it could only give the weasels a general idea of the direction of a threatening SAM site, and almost no sense of the distance. So the only way to get a, an exact sighting on that SAM site was to visually acquire it, and to do that, we'd go in high enough, Got we called it trolling, the, uh, to make sure they'd shoot at us, the, then uh, dodge the missiles, take it down, so to speak, then we could go in and find the SAM site from the smoke. You got them? Okay, I've got a good uh, launch. Okay. I've got a visual. Uh, so down, 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 down. So you dive, and the missile comes down with you. At the last moment, you pull up. The missile's going about Mach 3, and there's no way it can turn with you. So once we know and have pinpointed the SAM site, now we know where to launch the Shrike. And the Shrike homes in on the radar of the SAM site. There were a good many times <clears throat> that just by going through the profile that we'd have to go through to fire a Shrike, that we could actually intimidate the, the SAM site and make him go down. That's the whole idea of Weasel. Scare the hell out of them for a change. And whatever it took to get them to shut down was what we were after because it gave the strike flight enough time to get in, drop their bombs, and get out of there. Of course, the ultimate answer was to destroy the site so that we didn't have to bother with them the next day. The trouble with the Shrike is that its range is only about half that of the SAM. So I got thinking there must be some way we could improve our ordnance in that Shrike. And so we came up with the idea of pulling the nose of the airplane up 45 degrees and lobbing it, tossing it like a basketball into a basket. Some to, and sure enough, all that was free distance. Then it would still seek it out, and that allowed us to outgun them. We could shoot farther than they could. We finally got permission to try that system, and we fired six Shrikes, and we killed five Fansongs radar sites. The weasels were getting very clever, but the enemy was getting smart, too, learning how to play this deadly game standard rule was if you did the same thing two days in a row they probably gonna kill you the second day it was people against people I can remember stories on the air crews debriefing that they could tell when they were flying against the same operators on the ground that they flew against two or three days ago and it was a matter of matching the skill and cunning of the air crew versus the skill and cunning of the ground crew you had a very, very healthy respect for your adversaries because they were very good at what they did. They knew the weasels could evade missiles from one site, and maybe even two, but a third would catch them with little airspeed and less maneuverability. I'll never forget my first uh, Route Pack 6 mission. We came in feet wet, just north of High Fong, turned to the north to go up towards the Catpaw Valley, and just as soon as we got on the station, it seemed like whole hell broke loose. We had SAMs from three, four different locations at the same time, multiple coordinated firings, triple A all over the place. Heck, I was so busy just trying to survive, I didn't know where I was or what I was doing. Back then when we were getting it from all sides, you didn't know which SAM site was launching at you. So you didn't know which way to look for the missile. And even if you did, you didn't know if the missile was aimed at you. You could be dodging a missile that was intended for your wingman, and in the meantime, and miss seeing another one that was coming right at you. The evolution of the equipment was driven by the threat. We were involved in gamesmanship and technology as well as tactics. There was a sergeant at Tok Lee named Weldon Bauman, and he figured out a way to indicate on our scope which site was launching. So now we knew which way to look for the missile. Then there was his fighter pilot, Major Bob Climbing at Eglin, who came up with a device that said, you are the one being shot at. The game continued. Now the North Vietnamese started using radars outside the frequency range of our equipment. So the new F-105G weasel had a much broader frequency range and a new missile that could really challenge the SAMs. Had a bigger warhead, went faster, went farther, and you could program a turn into it. I'll never forget the first night I uh, used one of those AGM-78s. Fired against the SAM radar. And when it came off the rail, not only did it sound like a freight train, the whole world lit up like the sun in front of our eyes. We saw the missile go on out towards the radar site, down towards it. And then, when it detonated, the warhead blew up and took along a whole bunch of SAMs. Those SAMs just snaking all around the ground. We now we have standoff capability. We're shooting him from some distance away. Suddenly.